Hello, welcome to our second webinar here. Hi. So this is um, Daniele on the other window next to me that he's an image engineer working for Filmlight and I'm Andy, a colorist working for Filmlight. Today we want to show you some more new features that we're going to uh, release with Baselight 5.3. Yeah, I'm just thinking about further announcements. I guess one big thing is because this is a live webinar, we have the huge opportunity that you can ask questions and we can try answering them during the webinar. We just ask you to uh, focus the questions on the topics that we um, talk about in the presentations to not go too far off track. We actually have um, planned a separate webinar called Baselight Q&A, where we will just focus on um, yeah, all general questions regarding a Baselight um, from you. So if you have uh, more general questions, um, you can uh, focus this to our hashtag Baselight Q&A, which we will show uh, later. So what are today's topics? We will talk about a new lens correction operator in improvements in tracker and in resizing, uh, an improvement for shapes, curve grade, reconforming if uh, in exporter, metadata pipeline to EXR, and also some news about the daylight um, space light render platform. But I think um, I will just start um, instantly. And before I go into the um, user interface, I will um, kill my uh, webcam so that you can focus uh, full on the base light UI and we also use the bandwidth in the most meaningful way. I will do okay. the same thing. Okay, we're starting with lens correction. That's a new operator inside base light that can add or remove a lens distortion. And I'm not going to read through all the bullet points here because I think it makes more sense just showing the operator in action because as last time we're doing the presentation directly out of um, base light. So here I have a shot uh, from a GoPro and it has a really strong distortion. And to um, add the operator, I go into the transforms menu. There is lens correction. And here it is. And inside the operator, we have um, the easiest method to apply a, a correction is using the presets. So we ship the operator with um, several presets for example, of, uh, um, of some uh, photo lenses that come from an uh, open database, but we also measured um, a few lens series. For example, here the Arri Master Prime, Signature Primes, the Engineer Optimo um, Zooms, uh, the Cook Anamorphics, and also the Leica um, Sumilux uh, series. And for the Prime series, if, you, if we select one, you can see that we have then also the focal lengths then inside here as a separate drop down. Uh, just be aware of that we just measured always just one of these lenses that we got um, our hands on and that there might be some variation um, across the, the series because the, most of the cine lenses are more um, handmade and I guess have uh, maybe some variations. But usually it makes more sense to just uh, use the manual um, mode in the lens correction, which I think is the most powerful. And I will show you how that works. We uh, check that add lines button here. And then we just have to um, draw a, a line onto something that should be straight in the image. So here we have a very obvious um, example of that distorted um, door frame. And after I put at least uh, three points, I do a right click and then we can see it already starts to correct the image. If I'm not happy uh, with that, I can add an, another line to improve the uh, correction. And I can that couldn't do that either on the already processed image or I can do it on the unprocessed one. And you can see the, the points align here nicely. Also, if I'm going back to the unprocessed one, I can go in and uh, refine, for example, the position of an, in, in, in the, an individual point to um, uh, increase, uh, improve the accuracy. So in this case, maybe let's uh, already go to the processed one and I will just add a, se a second line um, for this one here. Uh, going through here and we saw, okay, it also, it changed the distortion a little bit. And I think we can, uh, we come to a 
quite good result. That's also seems stable um, in the movement. And what I can do with this one now is go to my other GoPro shots and apply the same. And I hope you can see the same thing here. I will do a little bit slower before after because of the frame rate issues um, in this webinar situation. Also on this one here, before, after. And so what else can we do? So here we have an, um, an anamorphic shot. And if I do a full bypass, we can see it. Actually, the uncorrected shot has a quite strong distortion because this is a wide angle vintage style anamorphic lens. And with the tool, I was able to correct this one quite good. And here there's another example of how we can use the operator is as a, what we call a lens correction sandwich. And I will show you what I mean by that. So, um, so we start here with the shot, just with a basic grade. And what I wanted to do in this case is do a paint, a clone stamp paint, painting this section here of the frame over onto this side. But if I would do that without a lens correction, it would uh, not fit. We will see that um, in a moment. So I have first uh, removed the distortion by drawing here a few lines. Then I did my paint uh, at work here, painting that section over to here. And then I inserted a second lens correction and I set the correction type not to remove or add, but I set it to auto, which is then uh, reversing what the previous one in the stack is doing. So if the first one is removing the distortion, the second one is adding it back. So basically, if we now uh, bypass all these three layers, we can see it's now doing just the paint um, job. And if we go in and if we would see the paint work without that correction, we uh, Hopefully you can also notice that now this is without the correction and now the angle here of these lights, uh, for example, is not fitting in smoothly with the other um, frames here. And this is basically the paint applied in the lens correction sandwich. And what we can also see is if I change the first one to add distortion, the second one automatically goes to remove distortion. So that's um, uh, also convenient. And the last use case is applying a lens distortion to an undistorted shot, maybe to um, as a creative tool. So here I have a shot that already has a grade, but I um, maybe want to add a, a little bit of distortion to it. And what I will do is I will copy the, the value that we got from this anamorphic lens here and apply it on the shot. But in this case, I will not use remove distortion, but add distortion. And so now we can see um, that we can uh, analyze the distortion on, on one shot and then apply it onto, a, um, uh, onto another shot. You, and you can use all kinds of reference frames for that. And if we think that this is maybe a little bit too much, we also have a distortion amount down here where we can control the amount of distortion that we want to add and if you want to go into even more detail we also have here three parameters from the lens distortion equation where you can then fine-tune your warp characteristics and even build your own ones from scratch if you want to okay so that's it for the lens distortion and i will jump to the next topic which is um uh, some improvements, especially in the UI, about um, tracking and trackers. And so we try to simplify the UI a lot uh, for the trackers. We um, have better possibilities to name tracks and uh, planes and to share them between uh, different layers. And also the, uh, probably the biggest plus in functionality is that we have a high pass, low pass filtering option now for the trackers. And okay, let's jump into it. Here we have a shot, and I'm not sure how well you can see that or in the webinar situation with a, with a strong light flicker, probably because of the lower FPS, you can barely see it, but um, 
what you can probably see is that the track that I added here um, for a shape on the lady's um, face is uh, jittering a lot. And obviously I could easily fix that by adding a deflicker operator before my tracker strip and then I would get a smooth track. But this is um, yeah, a good example to show how, how the filtering works. Because if we go to that tracker, so this is now the new tracker um, um, operator. Oh, here we can easily um, give a name to that track. I called it her face. And here the tracking backwards forwards are now uh, more obvious buttons and the extrapolation and deletion uh, delete buttons are here below. And here on the bottom, we have the new filtering sliders, which are similar to the filtering in the transform strip for um, stabilizing, for example. And I will zoom in a lot into the track so that you can hopefully see the, the jittering in the track here. And if I now um, apply a kind of low pass filtering, you can hopefully see that uh, white line below. So that's uh, basically the result of the filtering. So the yellow is the raw tracking uh, data and the white one is the filtered uh, version. And with the threshold here, I can uh, adjust the, the basically the, the, the threshold of the, of the filtering at, at what point um, you want to cut it off. But I remember the, the default worked um, quite well on that shot. And so, Let's have a look at that um, shape in playback and I hope it should be uh, much smoother now and not jittering anymore. Yeah, that looks much better. And, and another thing I wanted to show you is here that we made easier. So this shape that I added is reducing the exposure on her uh, on the left side of her face um, by three quarters of a stop here with base grid. But maybe her eye is now getting a little bit too dark. So what if I want to add a new layer and then uh, add, a, add a small shape uh, for her eye where I bring back the exposure, maybe by a stop. Yes, and uh, now I want to uh, attach that shape to the same track that I already made. So we can just go in here and here you can see, we see all the other tracks um, that we have on the shot. I will zoom out for a moment. So I, here I have one called her face, his mouth, uh, his left eye, his right eye. So it's very easy to, to attach that shape to the um, same track by using the naming and also the visual indication uh, where it sits and then that um, that shape is uh, moving along um, as well. Okay. One more thing I wanted to show is the sharing of planes. And I will um, start working on that shot here. I will first play it. It's um, quite short. Uh, what I want to do is I want to work a little bit on that uh, poster here on the wall. And I hope you will see in a moment uh, what I'm up to. So I'm adding a new layer and a shape. And on that poster, I wanna work in a perspective. And for that, I'm creating now first a plane in the shape strip. Now it asks me to pick uh, four points to define the plane or the perspective. So I'm putting, uh, picking the four corners of the poster. And now I'm adding a new rectangle shape. And what you should see is that the shape is now already drawn in the perspective. So it's already living inside um, that plane, which is nice. So this is a rectangle, but you can see it's uh, already having uh, some angled um, um, borders. And so I'm selecting now just this red area and, for example, going into a hue shift global and changing the color of it to yeah, maybe something uh, bluish. And if I go to the tracker strip, we can see that here besides trackers, we also have planes. Uh, so here we have the plane zero, and I can also name that here in the, in the tracker strip. For example, I call it poster, and I can add a an, um, perspective tracker already tr uh, to it. So I'm now tracking through the shot. Um, 
that plane. Uh, we see that uh, that our shape, because we we put it into that plane, is now already automatically moving along with the plane. So basically, the planes are a, an optional connection between trackers and shapes. So you can attach a shape. Uh, directly to a tracker, which I can do here if I say um, if I say that shape should be attached to the poster track. Now you can see now it's just a rectangle that's following the track, but it's not living inside the plane. Or we can put shapes inside planes and then track the planes. Now that shape stays in the plane. And the nice thing about these planes is that they are shareable. Um, across layers. If I add a new layer and I want to put a new shape, I can just reselect that poster plane and then maybe draw another shape here. And on this one, do a little bit different color. Yeah, so maybe something green. And, and this is not only true for um, shape strips, obviously, all the all the operators that work with uh, planes can reuse these planes. So for example, also the, the paint um, uh, operator, I can select uh, um, the poster plane and then go in here and for example, uh, paint this area here uh, over there and we can see it also paints um, in perspective and everything is already automatically tracked on the shot. So that's it uh, about uh, planes and trackers. All right. The next topic is a little bit more nerdy, but more for the, I would say, maybe pixel lovers among us, but uh, can also be important, and I'll try to explain what it's about. So here we see two different ways of processing, scaling inside a base light. And the top row, the process in viewing or render format, this is how base light works today. So this is the status quo. And this is also the default in 5.3. But uh, the second one, process and work in working format, is an option that you can choose in 5.3. OK, so let's first go to how scaling works at the moment. Base light concatenates all the format mappings, mappings and also the creative framing into one single transform and it applies it at the beginning of the processing so before the uh, before the grading stack is processed so um, um i have an example here on the next slide and i will jump to that one so that uh, that the numbers get a little bit more clear so in my example i have an 8k shot and i have a 4k title that i want to comp on top and I need to render my timeline in 4k and in 2k and what happens at the moment inside base light is for the 4k render let's start with the 4k render also we have a I need to mention we have a the scene set up in a 4k format but you will see that the, that the scene format is irre irrelevant in this scenario so in the 4k uh, render we take the 8k image and we scale it down to 4k because we need a 4k output we take the 4K title and it remains 4K because we need a 4K output. And then we comp the title on top in 4K and process the whole grading stack in 4K. And there's no, no additional scaling on the output side for the uh, render. And a 2K render goes like this. 8K input, scaled down to 2K. 4K title also scaled down to 2K. And in this case, the title is scaled and also the alpha of the title is scaled. And this is then an important part. And then we comp everything in 2K and process the stack in 2K because we don't need a higher resolution. And then this goes without any further scaling to the output. There are two big advantages of this um, approach. Is One is that we maximize the image quality because we always only apply one single scaling process. And the other advantage is the, uh, is the performance because we only process the stack in the a resolution that's necessary for the current um, display. So if you have a 4K scene and you only have connected an HD uh, display, then the whole processing is only happening in HD and this, this will save you some time in certain processes. But this also might uh, cause some minimal differences. That's why I'm going back to my first slide. 
That's why we added a new option now in 5.3 called process in working format. And in, in this mode, we will basically scale the image uh, twice if necessary. We will do a first scaling operation from the input format always to the working format. So basically to the format that you select for your scene. Then we process the grading always in the same format and the one of the scene. And then we do another scaling of the basically processed image to the final delivery format. And there's another slide for this. How would this look in the same example? So in both examples, 4K and 2K render, we will always scale 8K to 4K. The title remains 4K. Then we always comp and process the stack in 4K. And then the basically processed image is then scaled one more time to the desired output resolution like 4K and 2K. So I will show you where that setting is uh, hidden. It's in the scene settings and then format and color and there will be a process here in viewing render format and also process in working format. Also there's a um, mouse over um, text that explains the situation in a little bit more detail. And to show you these differences where it can make a difference is exactly that example. So this is a shot that was 8K, or basically I made an ultra HD title with alpha as an overlay, and then I rendered it to ultra HD and to HD. And here in the first example, I uh, processed both always in the render format. So I used the um, legacy or standard base light uh, behavior. And I added a, a counter so that you can follow when I'm jumping back and forth. And so also I need to note that we're now comparing them in HD uh, resolution. So we now just see differences uh, here uh, scaled to HD because we need to compare it in one resolution. And so here we have the text comped with the alpha in ultra HD and here it's in HD. And so I will go back and forth slowly once or twice and Probably or hopefully you can see a little bit of differences here at the edges of the text. And these are actually the differences that um, sometimes uh, were causing some maybe uh, problems. And if I jump to the new option uh, here, processing everything in Ultra HD, we can hopefully see that the images are almost identical. So the issue here was that we scaled the, the text and the alpha of the text, and then we did the comp in a different um, resolution. Okay, so going to the next topic, that is shapes. So I should turn off the counters. So we added an SVG import to the shape strip, and that was basically a customer request to, um, to import, for example, uh, comments from platforms like Pix. But I wanna show you um, another little bit more creative way of using this uh, option. So here I have a shot where I want to uh, improve maybe the connection to the other shots um, in the sequence. And I wanna add a shadow maybe here on the, on the floor. So I add a new layer, I add a shape to it. And in the shape layer, I then go to um, create shapes from SVG file. And here I have a, so I traced a, like a generic silhouette um, of a man, converted it to a um, vector format. So it has a, just a low number of control points. That's also important. You should not import SVGs with the thousands of points because this will, uh, might then affect the performance uh, of the scene. And uh, because also the project files will be, um, will get really huge. And so here we, now we have that a generic shape. And uh, what you can probably already guess is I'm putting the shape into a plane. So let's define a random, uh, not really random, but a kind of plane here, maybe rotate the shape already a little bit and here put him roughly um, in place. And to apply the effect of a shadow, I can use the base grade pick and match because we already have a rough reference here of that shadow. So inside that, uh, for the inside of that layer, let's go to base grade and pick and I select the um, shadow area. 
And then I'm already in match mode. I select the um, uh, brighter area. And now we have a very cheesy looking shadow. And so we need to uh, add a, a matte tool and blur the shadow a little bit. Also, it seems a little bit too strong for the um, for that distance um, of the man. And now we can also go in and refine, maybe refine our um, perspective plane a little bit so that the shadow makes a little bit more sense. And obviously this should then be maybe done a little bit, also a little bit more about the direction of the light. And the cool thing about these uh, vector shapes is that you can then still modify it. So if the guy should maybe a little bit more like an alpha guy, we could uh, make his legs um, be a little bit wider or because he's a soldier, we might uh, make the head a little bit bigger. So everything is easily edit editable. And or we could even try to um, put in something like the silhouette of a of a gun or something. So I mean, forgive me my drawing skills, but I guess you can probably see that this is some stuff that you would often probably not do um, uh, natively in the grading session. But if you have a set of generic um, of generic shapes, then um, this might be something that's easily um, applied and obviously if the shot would be moving then we would need to track it but um i guess you get the idea and i just want to show you like uh, one or two more examples so here in the in this a little bit more uh, film noir style and i guess you can already imagine i added the the blinds uh, the blind shadows um on his face uh, with a simple um vector shape that i added into a um, perspective and then i used another uh, track shape um for his face to uh, modulate it a little bit different on his face than on the background. And here's the last example why I added here um, the shadow of a tree on the on the road here, um, for example, just to give some ideas what this feature can also be used for. And the last topic that I want to talk about today uh, is curve grade. So we're also currently working heavily on the curve grade operator. And we can already show you some um, improvements that we have ready for 5.3. So um, as you probably noted is that we are working hard making most of the tool set color space aware inside baseline. And that's also true for curve grade. So we added indicators for black, uh, gray, so basically middle gray and diffuse white into the RGB and master curves. And we have a zoomable single graph layout and we have also uh, for people working with the panel, we have a new uh, mode controlling curve grade on the panel where the three trackballs control then three different points of the curve at the same time. So let's have a look at this. So here I have a shot and I'm already in the curve grade. And what the base light users might already note is that we have one uh, single curve here at the moment. So this is also something new. And, it, and now you can also like into an image or in the timeline, you can just use the standard pan and zoom um, mechanism into in, inside the curve. Obviously, you can also bring that back to the old behavior if I turn off single graph layout and if I turn off fit graph to the uh, panel. And, but I really like the new um, new style like this. And so the, these indicators here are drawn in the blue lines. So this is basically the diffuse white of my current uh, working color space. This is 18% gray. And this is the black point of the working color space, which in this case is a T-log. Also, we changed the scale here uh, from uh, 10-bit code values to uh, more generic linear light, 0 to 1. Uh, numbers and let's see how these indicators here move because uh, for people constantly working with curve grade on um, log uh, images they know that for example um, if I put here a point at black and if I touch the, the area below that it does not have any effect on the image because basically the, the black point of the log image um, is somewhere around here so so then this has an um, effect on the image and the same is here for the white point. 
So if I want to, let's make that a little bit bigger. So if I want to affect mostly here these bright snowy areas in the image and want to give them a push, uh, uh, I already know uh, here for that shot that they lie roughly around diffuse white, so I can then easily then give them a push and this uh, works well. Also, we could maybe zoom in already a little bit to do that a little bit more precise. But what if I would work in a different color space? So I'm simulating this now by changing my working color space to log 3 g 10 So I'm doing this now here in the scene settings. Obviously, you would not do that on a, um, if you want to change it just for the operator, you would do it with the color space strip. But now you can see it more better how these lines here are moving um, live. So if I go to log um, 3 g 10 and zoom out we can see that now um, gray is here and white is here it's basically now if i'm moving that thing here so i'm moving into this here one more time and maybe also a little bit into the image so that you see it better now that curve grade has almost no effect because the, these luminance values are at a different uh, position and uh, here around the uh, diffuse white, so I can take my three points and should uncheck lock X positions and move them uh, roughly over diffuse white. And if I'm now taking that point, now we can see, okay, now we can do the same uh, modification um, again. So, um, so these are the first things that we uh, that we did on um, curve grain. There's much more to come, but uh, that's it from me for today. And so now we have time for some uh, Q and A. So I'm seeing if uh, you already submitted some questions. Yes, there were um, quite a lot of um, uh, some questions. Uh, most of them were a little bit specific about uh, um, uh, tracking and, um, and and lens distortion, which were a little bit uh, detailed. But maybe one question which we could pick out is um, what kind of filtering does the lens correction use? What can we expect in terms of blurring? Should I answer this or do you know that? Um, I guess maybe better if you answer it because I'm not the super mathematical guy. Yeah, so the, um, the, the lens distortion uses the same image processing as the, the grid warp. So it's, a, it's basically a per pixel anti-aliasing um, um, algorithm. So we will anti-alias um, every pixel only for the amount which for that area which is needed so we're not doing any um, yeah um, more blurring than necessary to avoid aliasing so if you know the quality of our grid warp this will be basically exactly the same um, equality you can expect from the lens distortion yeah then when there were some other questions about uh, yeah planar tracking versus shape tracking but i think that um, um, that were very specific ones um okay all right so maybe then on the so second maybe. half there will be more questions yeah yeah i mean we have another round of q a at the uh, at the end so i guess we can um switch over to um daniela's part of the presentation Okay. Uh, I guess we turn off our webcams um, for the second half. Yes. All right. We'll so I will, pick the second, I will pick the second half and you will um, in the background answer your questions. Um, okay. So I, I, I've picked a few um, yeah, more workflow related um, features. The one is um, conforming. We we have um, improved our in, um, conforming capabilities. Um, let me show you how, how this works. So basically what we can do is we can now reconform selected shots um, quite easily. For this we will do a, um, a, a little conforming exercise here live. So um, when we conform an AF, XML or EDL, let me load one and maybe we don't have all of the shots or some of the shots are um, are um, 
yeah need different conforming rules to be found or are rich effects which which come later that all um, basically um, will lead to that we cannot conform all of the media in one hit so I'm, I'm just um, now selecting the media which I have at that time and I start conforming I don't know the the conforming rules so I leave this all on try all options so it will do a brute force conform and then it, uh, the system asked me also to set the container this is really imp important uh, um, to set the container correctly the container is the root of the project and every file will be linked relative to this path into your scene so when you then in a later stage maybe need to move your whole project then you in in, in baseline you only need to change the container so in order to relink um, everything so setting up the container is really important so now the the system tries all options and it found uh, three hits with 97 percent so that's um, good but obviously a few shots were not found so if we go here at some point we will see an x that means the missing media and now if we just want to confirm those um, we go to the shots view which is more like a spreadsheet view of my, my scene, um, where I can also modify metadata, where I can um, yeah, filter based on uh, material, and based on uh, metadata criteria here. And what I can do here is say, select missing material. So it will go through the scene and will select all of the shots which are not linked up yet. And here can, I can say conforms three selected shots. Now it will not construct an EDL or it will not use an EDL, but it will construct a conforming source from my selection. And now I can point maybe to um, my folder where I think those medias live um, and also do a brute force conform. And now 100%, I got them all and now also those are linked and the, the, the beauty really is that you can use the shots view and the mighty and powerful filtering to pre-select some sort of maybe drone shots um, um, and 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 build um, tabs and and selection and then based on that um, kick off individual conforms so this should help you to um, yeah to make your conforming uh, much easier okay so Next thing is we have uh, started rationalizing our exporters. We started with the metadata exporter. Um, that means everything which is not uh, media files. We try to make um, the, the handling of variables a little bit more intuitive. We added um, a, a preview, how your uh, uh, folder structure will evolve during the export. And we also register and we also send um, and transmit the export to the queue manager so it's a properly um, a locked um, yeah um, operation in the queue and this is basically a pre-stage so that you can um, 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 interact with metadata exports via the Filmlight API and at a later stage we want to unify the exporter so the metadata exporter large CDLs um, and yeah, all of the other metadata-driven exporters and the media in one place, so you have one centralized place, which is not the case yet, but this is a first step. Um, okay, let's take the same scene we have here. Let's put just a basic grade on. Um, just add one layer called this a term, let's say tech grade, where we want to do the exposure. And then at another one, another layer, put this on layer number 999. Call this look. This is our default, let's say, for that show our look. I'm going to select that vision look, which I really like. Um, we'll drop this um, to all shots, oh, but not twice. Okay, so this is just a, um, a basic operation. So now let's let's see how those exporters work. So if we go to the shots view, and if we select, let's say, a few shots, and for example, we want to export BLGs, 
Here we can see we have added types of variables um, uh, for you. So you can basically pick yeah, certain um, variables and you can modify them as well. So you can, for example, for the tape name, what we can do is you can say, I want to trim my tape name, let's say from the beginning with five numbers and from the end with six uh, characters, so string uh, formatting as well, which um, previously you would need to um, yeah, type in basically raw um, expressions. Uh, and I, I think it's a, a little bit more um, friendly here to use um, yeah predefined ui here and also what is um, really good is you can um, visualize how, uh, what it would uh, be basically on your uh, folder st uh, structure so you can preview before you export if the um, yeah your templates work as expected and you don't do this every time you export something um, we have a strong template system so once you set this up once and then when you actually do a, a production you um, just reuse those templates and this is all configured for you so this is uh, really more work for uh, for someone who sets up a pipeline um, yeah and now when we press ok it will register that export in a scene uh, sorry it will um, it will send that operation into the the queue monitor and here i can see the state of, of it and if it's a long export i can work in parallel where before it it was a modal um it locked basically the the um, the user interface um yeah and at a later stage we hope to get all the exporters in one place so that you can set up visual effects pools dailies renders cdls uh, lots blgs reports all from one uh, place okay we have greatly improved our um, meter data pipeline to exr um, we we see that um, um, handing meter data from various formats into the uh, post-production pipeline especially for visual effects it's really important we had we were really early with the re meter data bridge but now we have um, enlarged our support for piping uh, raw meter data from various types of um, formats into um, open exr and um, so now we virtually uh, pipe um, almost all meter data into um, um, XR. Let me show you how this works. So I got a, a shot of um, with different sources. This is a, a Sony um, raw shot here, and this is a TIFF file. Um, this is a RE uh, a raw shot, and this is a red shot, and this is a JPEG. Um, and if we ex inspect the meter data there's lots of meter data in in here and even more hidden in the in the really down in the in the raw essence and now when we export open xrs it's nothing you really need to do as long as you render open xr and now if we inspect the the open xr from a visual effects perspective let me open you for this and now when we drag those axrs into nuke first of all you should see that the colors are right um, the same colors as in baselight how we achieved this we explained two weeks ago on the webinar um, here but if we look also on the meter data we can see this is the um, sony shot we get the cook um, uh, lens meter data the, the sony uh, meter data all sorts of um, we, we write our own metadata as well which was the, exp um, the color space while exporting which was the one when we decoded the original all sorts of in, um, interesting information um, if you look on the tiff file here 
we can see that the software was uh, a DC raw, which was used to produce that TIFF file was from a Fuji XT2 camera, all sorts of um, additional uh, metadata. Same is true if we look on the on the JPEG. So this is an XR from the JPEG, and we literally put in um, all the EXIF metadata. And um, yeah, now we can see that Lightroom was used to produce this JPEG, and all the Lightroom stack even is in here. Not sure if we need this now, but yeah. So this is the RE the RE raw shot. So we believe that um, yeah, yeah, maintaining metadata through the production pipeline just helps everyone. Um, yeah, and the same is true for um, um, red files as well. So I hope this will improve yeah, the collaboration between uh, post and visual effects. All right, so let's go back to our slide deck. We added um, support in 5.3 for uh, Pixbang. Pixbang is um, additional file compression, which um, uh, it's a proprietary system uh, where you can add um, compression to existing file formats like OpenXR, RE Raw, Sinion, and more. And for reading and writing those um, um, special files, or special compression. Um, yeah, we wrote a support. This is a it's 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 a, a license system, so you would you need a, a Pixpen license for that. But this helps you to um, yeah reduce um, yeah file size on your on your server, but still working with industry standard um, file formats. So that's really nice. I think this is already this already rolled out in the last release of 5.2, and we added um, a video output uh, options. So now with the Kona 5, we can go up to 12G SDI, and we have added a few additional metadata. So you can uh, and configuration. Now you can configure um, the what full range actually means. If it's 70 full range or a really full full range. Um, you can uh, specify the RGB to YCC matrix. Before of that, it was all really, um, based on resolution and, and other things. But now you can um, you can uh, choose this uh, in in the setups. We added SDI and HDMI metadata for HDR primaries and for the HDR EOTF. So that should help you to hook up um, yeah easily um, HDR monitors with your system so that the the monitor and the grading system starts to talk to each other which is nice and uh, one really cool thing is that you can change the setup um, dynamically so you do not need to restart base light when you change the video output mode um, for the oh, base oh, light oh, oh, oh. I, I guess I hear some people here cheering <laughs> and clapping on the streets outside my window about this one <laughs> Yes, exactly. Yeah, so this is really good, and it helps really in the, in the <laughs> to speed up, yes, uh, setups. So you don't need to change something, restart base light, and so on. So it's it's a nice one, but it's a, a small one, but a very nice one. Um, then I want to talk if one two minutes about daylight. Daylight is a, our sh our shot based grading system designed for um dailies so it's it can do everything basically can do the same file io um the, the comprehensive support for acquisition intermediate and delivery formats um it has the same rescaling filtering burn-in and masking operation and the same color management obviously and and our customers really want to use daylight more as a transcoding platform especially now with the, the introduction of the Filmlight API, there's a lot, a lot you can automate in in post production um, using such a powerful transcoding um, application. And it has the render queue. It really fits very nice in the uh, in the overall ecosystem. The thing is that uh, um, previously Daylight was only available for uh, macOS, and we changed this now. So we will have um, we will deliver Daylight on all the three platforms. The, um, we have will have daylight on Mac, and there, there is already custom built, special built daylight systems that um, are shipped on uh, Filmlight OS. But what we also do is a software 
um, only um, product daylight which will run on CentOS 8.1 on your own hardware as long as it fulfills our requirements for graphics cards and drivers and and, and hardware um, that, that's really great so you can install daylight on your on your own um, customer supplied hardware which helps yeah to um, I think to use daylight in, in many many different aspects it also helps Daylight to scale with demand and, and to repurpose existing hardware. And with this also in dailies, you can really scale from a very simple setup where you have just a Daylight on a MacBook to and maybe a, a compressed um, shoot with one camera. You can easily do this maybe on a lightweight system. And if you need a little bit more power, then you can use um, Daylight on a real workstation based on, on, on CentOS, on Linux. And if you need even more power than you can use the Mac and in the background render and store everything on the Flux store. The Flux store is a storage product from us, which also has uh, cheap, uh, three GPUs. And you can use this to offload all of the rendering um, on onto your storage. So the storage is also the rendering um, resource. And if you really have a Lexus 65, multiple cameras, a lot of um, uh, material then you can scale this even out by having daylight on a strong workstation and a flux store or several flux stores in the background so we have a few customers that use those kinds of setups very successfully in production so this becomes really now a, a system that scales basically um, however what you cannot do is render base light scenes in uh, with uh, on, on a daylight and um, because of this we also announced another product um, which is which hits into the same kind of um, area. It's called Baselight Render, and this is kind of a headless render instance. Um, it can run on customer-supplied hardware again on CentOS. Um, so it needs to just um, uh, fulfill our requirements for again graphics cards, drivers. It needs to be compatible with CentOS 8.1, and it's it's uh, yeah it can augment very nicely your Baselight or Daylight workflows and also base light render comes with the film light api so um, so that you can use high level scripting languages like python or java to automate many of your labor intensive tasks as uh, good as possible and it supports multi gpu rendering yeah so um, with those additional platforms operating system and, and products we hope we can um, help you build a very efficient pipelines that was a quick one so um yeah some questions maybe um let me put on my camera again yeah so let's also um turn on my camera yeah so we had a few questions uh, and also i was busy answering a lot of them so i'm just going in so there was one uh, question um, can you modify the metadata when you do a reconforming of uh, missing shots basically so for example change the, the source tape name yeah oh i forgot to mention that yeah you can that's um that's actually a good thing so you can filter shots you can modify the tape name the clip name you can truncate stuff and then kick off a new conform so it will use the um metadata from the shots view to yeah do the reconforming yeah really good question uh, yeah then um, yeah, then there was one question, is the AXR lens metadata dynamic per frame, like the, for example, the focus distance? Yes, it is, yeah. And then there was one more question about the lens um, distortion. The, the, the question was if we uh, can change it, uh, the distortion during the shot, and yes, uh, we can also um, do that um, by keyframing all the param parameters. And then there's a then, then there were questions solve. about oh, sorry. so the solve of, of, of your lens distortion will will uh, or when you draw those lines or when you pick a preset then you actually what's happening is we're fitting um three parameters so those uh, poly, that those that are fed into this equation and those you can keyframe animate yes I am. So we had the question of how these changes will flow into the um, other products, especially additions. Um, so everything that we showed today and um, yeah. 
Yeah, so the we we are um, we will start once Baselight five point three is out for Baselight, we will look into um, yeah uh, porting the functionality um, into Baselight edition. So this will after after Baselight main development is uh, is finished, it will um, yeah it will there will be a five point three of Baselight edition shortly afterwards. Yeah, I think that's maybe that uh, that's it maybe for today. So thanks for all of your questions. Also, we will um, for for the more specific ones, we will send um, uh, follow ups um, in the next days. And yeah, so thanks for spending the the session with us today. And Thank you. We will try to uh, prepare the video as fast as possible so that you can share it uh, maybe with colleagues, and friends um, in the next days. And we also want to thank our magic webinar fairy, which in the background pulls all of the triggers. So it's great thanks to yeah, all of the ones that are working in the background to make this possible. Yeah. So okay. Then bye bye. Bye bye.